Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University on the Dice Tower. Today, we'll be teaching you how to play Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice. Game designed by Thibault Delatoine, Fabrice Lamide, and Manuel Rozoy, and published by Triton Noir. The board game is based on the popular Assassin's Creed video games by Ubisoft. Let's get to the table! Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice is a scenario-driven campaign game set in the Assassin's Creed universe. You will play as the Assassins, fighting your way through the guards on your way to try to complete the game's objectives. Will you hide in the shadows and take out your foes secretly? Or will you attract more alarm by fighting in the open with blazing intent? The choice is yours as you fight your way through a range of scenarios and level up your assassins to fight tougher and greater foes. Much of the game's campaign information is kept secret in envelopes which you'll find in the game box. To set up your campaign, first take the envelopes from the assassins that you'll be choosing to play as. The Assassin's Creed campaign plays between two and four assassins. You can play any number of players, including solo, but will be splitting those assassins among the players. Whenever you open an envelope, you'll find a number of cards inside, but first find the large sized card with the red warning label at the top. You'll follow all of the instructions on this card and it will tell you which other cards from this envelope to reveal and which ones to leave in the envelope. To begin the campaign, you'll take only the large Assassin Apprentice card and place it onto a player board, putting all other cards back in the envelope. Your Apprentice will be leveled up to your named Assassin after the first scenario, or memory. Take three white action cubes which are placed on these grouped spaces, three red health cubes placed on this track, and your mini with a base ring in any colour except red. Your player board has space for all of your different equipment and skills, but you won't start the first memory with any of those. The rest of your setup will be guided by the memory that you're playing in the campaign booklet. Firstly, the setup section tells you which components you'll need and how to place them. Lay out all of the tiles, paying attention to wall placement. This icon represents an objective base, and you'll place this base with the matching numbered piece inside it. If any enemy minis share a space with one, you'll place it into one of the lobes. Starting from your third memory, you'll place lettered enemy entrance tokens next to the rooms where enemies will enter the game. Place the compass near the map, as this will influence which direction the enemies move. And place any other tokens that are dictated by your scenario. Note that these orange exclamation marks have no specific function, they're there to remind you of something that is related to this scenario. This differs from the red tokens which have a specific function we'll cover later. Finally, place your assassins on their start space which will be at one of the fast station minis. Now it's time to open this scenario's envelope, and as for the character envelopes, you will end up with a stack of large and small cards with a red warning on the top large card. This card tells you how to treat all of the other cards in the envelope. Among the large cards, you'll find event cards which are prepared into an event deck, enemy cards which show you the statistics of your enemies and go on this central board, and towers and keys which have a specific effect on this memory and are placed next to the map. Small cards, which generally relate to equipment or weapons of different types, come in three main types. Equipment, which goes into a shuffle deck, chests, which go into an ordered deck, and rewards, which are gained at the end of a memory. There are some other types of cards, but we'll see those later. Then flip over this memory's warning card as a player aid, and this is important because not all of the actions I'm going to go through here are available in every memory. And do note that anywhere you see this blue numbered lozenge, this will be referring you to a specific passage in the main rulebook. Now return to the campaign booklet and read the objectives and the 100% sinks for this memory. You will need to complete each objective and leave the map in order to pass the memory. And these may involve passing the objectives on the objective bases that we saw earlier, or may involve other descriptive requirements. 100% sinks are optional to complete, and note that some memories will include a failure condition. 
Read through sections 4 and 5, as this may give you some special rules for this memory, and you're ready to play. Assassin's Creed is played in turns, and each turn is played in four phases. First is the event phase, where you will draw and resolve an event from the event deck. Second is the assassin phase, where all assassins will move and take actions on the map. Third is the enemy phase, where you will resolve the enemy actions. And finally is the end of turn phase, where you'll check for the end of the game and then reset for the next turn. You will repeat this turn sequence until the memory is complete. So now let's look at each phase in detail. First is the event phase, and to begin this, each assassin refills to three action cubes in this grouped section. Ignore the bonus action space at this time. Then draw and resolve the top card from the event deck. This may cause a once-off effect to happen on the map, or it may cause an ongoing effect which occurs for the rest of this turn only. If the event deck ever runs out, then shuffle the discard pile into a new deck. Next comes the Assassin phase, where the Assassins will take actions. Each action costs a number of action cubes, which the Assassins may spend from the normal grouped area or from the bonus space. There is no set turn order. Assassins may take their actions in whichever order they please and may go back and forward between each other. The phase ends once all Assassins are either out of cubes or no longer wish to take any actions. Before we take you through all of the different actions, we need to talk you through a very important concept, and that is being incognito versus being exposed. You are assassins. You want to stay in the shadows and you want to be unrecognized. This allows you to do your dirty work away from the watchful eyes of the guards. You begin the game incognito, and when you're incognito, you will have your colored base ring around your mini. An incognito assassin has a much broader range of actions available than an exposed assassin, and an incognito assassin is never targeted for attack by the game's enemies. However, certain actions or scenarios that you may take in the game may result in your assassin becoming exposed. When this happens, you'll replace your coloured base ring with a red one. Your range of actions becomes much narrower, and you can now be targeted for attack by enemies. But on the plus side, you no longer have to be sneaky, and so you can launch much more boisterous attacks on your enemies without fear of further exposure. Striking the right balance between being incognito and exposed is a key part of the game. Once you've become exposed, it is possible to become incognito again, perhaps by slipping away to another location. We'll cover exactly how to do this later, but when you become incognito again, you swap your red base back for your coloured base, and leave your red base on the square where this happens. As far as the enemies are concerned, this is your last known location, and the enemies may still chase you there, even though you comfortably slipped away into the shadows. Any such red bases remain only for one turn, and they are removed in your next end of turn phase. That is, at the end of the current turn. It's also important to understand the alert state, which is how well the guards recognise that there is an assassin risk in their midst. When an assassin becomes exposed, this will often, although not always, result in the alert state being triggered to active. When the alert is active, you'll have more guards reinforcing those on the map, and the scenario becomes more difficult. The alert state does not revert to inactive, even if all players have gone incognito again, and there are only some specific effects in the game which will put this back to inactive. As such, it pays for the players to be cautious, and to avoid activating this alert as long as they can. So now that we understand these concepts, let's go through all of the actions available to the assassins. First, we'll take you through the actions which may be done whether you are incognito or exposed. The first such action is movement, which costs one action point. To take this, you may move to any nearby space, and a nearby space is defined as your space and an orthogonally adjacent space which is not blocked by a wall. So either of these two assassins could move here, here, or here, but not here. And likewise, this assassin could move here, here, and here, but not here. 
Assassins are agile and may freely move from the street to the roof without the aid of a ladder. There are several extra steps which may be triggered by your movement. If you step onto a canal space, you will go into the water. Assassins hide in the water while guards stay on land. Ranged weapons and some other equipment cannot be used from a canal, but otherwise this space functions just like any land space. If you're incognito and you enter a square containing any enemies, then you must undergo a detection test. Roll as many red dice as there are enemies in the square to see whether they see you. If you roll any of the eye symbols, then you are detected. You immediately become exposed and the alert state is flipped to active. On the roll of this symbol, you become exposed only if the alert state is already active. As such, the alert state doubles your chance of being detected. If you enter a square containing this token and at least one enemy, then you bypass the detection test and are automatically exposed and trigger the alert. An exposed assassin who moves to a square containing no enemies becomes incognito again. You'll leave your red base on the square you move to, but you don't change the alert state of the game. Note that this occurs only for moving to a new square, not eliminating all guards from your existing square. In this instance, you're still exposed. Think of it as any new guards being able to ask passers-by in that square who the assassin is. Finally, if an exposed assassin leaves a square containing guards, then half of those guards rounded up will attempt to hunt the exposed assassin. To fully understand how hunting works, we need to understand enemy movement, and so we'll come back to the details of that later in the video. Next we'll talk about equip, which is how you manage the equipment items on your player board. The apprentice has room for a melee weapon, a ranged weapon, an armour, and five inventory slots. Inventory slots can hold excess weapons, or they can hold specific inventory items. Once an apprentice has been upgraded to a fully fledged assassin, the assassin will also be able to hold a hidden blade. Armour has no effect other than to increase your number of health cubes, so slot it into this slot here, and then add the number of health cubes shown to your bar. If you replace old armour with new, then you only add the difference in cubes between the two armours. Adding a new equipment item that you've collected into an empty slot is a free action, costing no action points. Likewise, discarding an equipment item in order to make room for another costs no action points. A card showing this icon is discarded to its relevant discard pile, while one showing this X icon is discarded from the campaign entirely. However, if you want to equip a new item without discarding the old one, it will cost you one action point to move an item into your inventory, and then free to add the new item to the slot. The other equipment action is trading, and it costs one assassin one action point to initiate. All assassins on that assassin square may now freely trade equipment items among themselves. The next action is attack. It costs one action point and must be done using an equipped melee or range weapon. First, choose the target square for your attack. When you attack, you are attacking a square, not a specific enemy. With a melee weapon, your square must be your current square, and with a ranged weapon, it can be any nearby square. Next, roll a number of white attack dice based on the number of stars shown on the weapon. Each star and special icon counts as one hit. Additionally, if you roll at least one special icon, then you'll get to resolve the special effect on the weapon that you've used. Each swords icon that you roll counts as a miss and will trigger retaliation after the fight. Now assign the hits you've rolled to the enemies in your target square. The enemy card on the central board shows the number of hits required to eliminate it. So with these two hits, you could kill two crossbowmen or one seeker. You must defeat an enemy at once. You could not use this to kill one crossbowman and do partial damage to a seeker. For any enemies that you've killed, lay their minis down on the square. This represents their bodies, and these can cause detection and alert later on, so you'll want to hide them, but more on that later. Now check the detection and alert icons in the top right corner of the weapon you've used. 
If the detection icon is red, you become exposed, and if the alert icon is red, the alert state becomes active, if not already. This occurs even if there are no enemies left on the target square. Again, think of it as passers-by alerting the guards to your attack. Finally, if there are any enemies left alive on the target square, and you roll at least one retaliation icon, then you become exposed, and all such enemies in whose attack range you are currently standing will retaliate. Retaliation works the same way as a normal enemy attack, and so we'll learn about that later in the video. In the case where you make a ranged attack, but all of the surviving guards are melee, you'll still be exposed and raise the alert, but you won't suffer a retaliation attack. This guard sees you, he just can't get you. If multiple assassins are within range of the same target square, then they may launch a coordinated attack. Each assassin involved simultaneously spends one action cube, and then all of their attack dice are pulled together and rolled. Then all of the hits from the coordinated attack are applied at once, before any retaliation can occur. This will help you avoid big retaliations when you're attacking squares containing a lot of enemies. The ability for crossbowmen to retaliate, both locally and at range, is one of the toughest elements of this game. And if you wish to play an easier game, you can ignore all retaliation from crossbowmen. This is the only difference between the easy and normal difficulties of the game, and you can swap to the easy mode in the middle of a memory if you wish. There are two more actions which can be done without restriction. The first is to use an equipment item from your inventory. The card will tell you how many action points you are required to spend, how to resolve the card, and how to discard it once you're done. The last option is to save an action, and to do this you take a cube from your group and place it onto your bonus space. This can be spent on a subsequent turn to give you four actions, or it can be spent during an enemy phase to give you the ability to respond to an enemy action. But more on that later. Next we'll take you through all of the incognito actions, and these can only be carried out by an incognito assassin, or an exposed assassin on a square containing no enemies. The first is to complete an objective, and this is one of these hexagonal tokens on an objective base. It will show you a number of action cubes that have to be spent. And the assassins who are on that square, excluding any who aren't allowed to take the action, must combine to spend that many action cubes in order to complete the objective. Take the objective token off the board, and then flip it over in your collection. This will show a number of experience points that the team will gain. You may attack an enemy using your hidden blade, and this will have its action cost printed here, as well as how to resolve it. This is a much stealthier way to fight your enemies than using your heavy melee weapons. For one action point, you may hide all of the bodies on your square. To do this, simply return the bodies to the general supply of minis. While you're hiding the bodies, you may also optionally search them for equipment. One at a time, draw a number of equipment cards up to the number of bodies that you're hiding, and then you may keep any number of these equipment cards, equipping them on your board according to the rules we described earlier. Do note, however, that hiding bodies is suspicious, and if at any point you draw an investigation card, you must resolve its negative effect, and then stop searching. You will still successfully hide the bodies, irrespective of what happens on the investigation card. If the equipment deck ever runs out, then shuffle the discard pile into a new deck. For one action point, you may open a chest. To do so, remove the chest mini from the board, draw the top chest card and equip it in the way described before, and take one of the cardboard chest tokens. This will give you experience points, and it will remind you that you've taken a chest in this game, in case you lose the scenario and have to reset. As a free action, an assassin who is on a square containing a hiding spot may enter that hiding spot. There are two different types of hiding spot. A rooftop garden, which is represented by one of these minis, or a cart or haystack with tower adjacency. Each of these 2x2 two two tower tiles in the game will have one square around it where you can see a cart or a haystack, and that is the hiding spot for this tile. 
there may only be one assassin per hiding spot, and if you're exposed when you enter a hiding spot, you become incognito. While in a hiding spot, there are only four actions available to the assassin. To attack an enemy using a hidden blade, to hide bodies on that square, to use an equipment item, or to exit the hiding spot. These all cost their normal action points, and exiting the hiding spot is free. However, if there are guards on the square, then you will need to do a detection test as if you moved onto that square. From a square adjacent to the tower, you may spend one action point to move to the top of the tower. An exposed assassin who does this becomes incognito. The tower is not a conventional square, and there's only one action available there, to synchronise. This costs one action point, is done once per memory, and results in you flipping over this memory's tower card, adding new features to the map according to what's shown on the card. To leave the tower, take a leap of faith for zero action points. You must jump down into the one of the four squares which contains the hiding spot. You treat it as if you moved into that square, and then if you're not detected, you may enter the hiding spot for free as usual. The final action is to leave the map using a fast travel station. If you are exposed, leave your red ring on that square. At least in the simpler memories at the start of the campaign, that assassin is now out of this scenario. The enemy phase is resolved in three steps. Enemy reinforcement, where new guards will come onto the map. Enemy movement, where they'll move around. And enemy combat, where the enemies will attack the assassins. Before or after any of these three stages, assassins may spend action cubes from their bonus slot in order to respond to what the enemies are doing. We'll take you through the basic rules for how each of these three steps works, but two general rules first. First, any rules on the enemy card will supersede any of the basic rules. And secondly, if the basic rules ever give you an ambiguous choice, it is the player's right to choose whatever option works best for them. To resolve the reinforcement step, draw the top card from the reinforcement deck. You will play from a different deck depending on your assassin count. Then depending on whether the alert status is active or inactive, you will add the given number of your melee guard or your ranged guard to the enemy entrance matching the letter on this card. When the deck runs out of cards, reshuffle the discard pile to a new deck. Once you've added new guards, resolve detection tests in entrance squares which contain at least one body or at least one incognito assassin who is not in a hiding place. Here for example there are two live guards and so both this assassin and this body would roll two dice for detection. Detection tests for assassins work the same way as described before, while if a body is detected it simply triggers the alert. Although each assassin and body rolls separately for detection, all of those rolls on a given square are considered part of the same single detection test, which is important for the purposes of some powers and abilities which influence a detection test. All detection tests in the same reinforcement phase are considered simultaneous, and so the alert being triggered in one square will not make these icons active in another square on the same turn. There is a maximum of four enemy miniatures on any given square, which includes both alive and bodies. If you are to bring a reinforcement onto a filled square which has at least one body, then remove the body and roll for a detection test which includes all of the recently placed minis. If you need to place a guard but have no more minis left, then you immediately lose the memory. Next is enemy movement, and here you must evaluate each enemy on the board and determine whether it moves. First find the enemies who will not move under any circumstance, and these are the enemies who are presently on an objective base, defending that objective, or on a square which contains a red base, that is either an exposed assassin or the last known whereabouts of a now incognito assassin. In this case, these three enemies will not move. Next, move each enemy who is nearby to a red base into the square containing the red base. So here, this enemy would move here, this enemy would move here, and this enemy would have the choice. 
The players would prefer to move it here because there's no assassin there. Finally, check the direction showing on this round's event card, and then starting from the most extreme row or column in that direction, move any guards who are yet to move one step in that direction. Enemy movement is blocked by a change between roof and street level where there is no ladder present, by a square which already contains four enemy minis, or by a wall, and if an enemy's movement is blocked then it doesn't move this turn. If a guard enters a square with an empty objective base, then it takes up position on that base. Finally, after all the movements are resolved, you'll resolve detection tests the same way you did in the reinforcement phase. Now that we've learned about enemy movement, we'll just step back quickly and talk about how hunting works. When an exposed assassin moves out of a square containing one or more guards, then half of those guards rounded up will follow if they are legally allowed to do so according to the movement rules. So in this instance, these two guards could legally follow. But if this assassin were to move up here, this guard cannot legally follow because there's no ladder. As such, the hunt ends, and because there are no enemies here, the assassin becomes incognito once again. For this movement, two of these enemies would in theory follow, but three of them are frozen by the subjective base, meaning only one would follow. While for this movement, none of the guards would follow because they're all already on a space containing a red base assassin. He does not become incognito because there's still an enemy in the destination space. The last step is enemy combat, and here each enemy that is within attacking range of a square containing an exposed assassin will make an attack. In this phase, any leftover red bases don't have an impact, and any incognito assassins are safe from attack. For each enemy, choose the square that it will target. A ranged enemy that has options both on its square and the nearby square will always choose its square first. In this case here, these three crossbowmen will all target this square, this crossbowman will target this square, while these two melee guards will not attack. Attacks on the same square are coordinated, and so these three will all attack at once. The enemy card shows you how many of the black attack dice that enemy rolls in combat. So then gather and roll all of the dice for the single or coordinated attack. Each shield is defended, and each star scores a hit which results in the loss of one health cube from the player's player board. When there are multiple exposed assassins in the same target square, then take all of the attack dice and distribute them as evenly as possible before rolling between the assassins. Each assassin then rolls their own dice and suffers any hits independently. Do note that these rules also hold true in the case of a retaliation. Here, for example, if these two attacked, then these two would retaliate only against this assassin because they'll always target their square before a nearby one. But if this assassin were in here, then the retaliation dice would be split evenly before being rolled. When you lose your last health cube, you go into a critical condition. Any leftover hits from this attack are lost, and you lay down your mini on the board. If you were exposed, you remove your red base entirely, not leaving it on the space. In this condition, your only effects are to draw back up to three action cubes at the start of the next turn, and to engage in a trade which is initiated by another player's action. To come out of this condition, you must be healed by the action of another player, at which point you stand up and can continue taking actions with the cubes you have. However, if no one heals you by the end of the turn after the one in which you were knocked down, then you are eliminated from the memory. This will also have an impact on future memories, which we'll cover later in the video. Finally, you'll resolve the end of turn phase. Check to see if the memory has been won, which occurs if you have completed all of the objectives, and at least one assassin has left the map via the fast travel station, and there are no more assassins on the map. If you haven't yet won the memory, then proceed to the next turn. We're now going to talk about a few of the mechanics which don't appear in the early scenarios, but will come a little bit later on in the campaign. We'll obscure any story spoilers, but if you want to avoid any mechanic spoilers as well, skip ahead to the next section. 
A boss is a strong enemy indicated by this skull icon. It will have a number of health cubes which depends on your player count. Bosses behave in fundamentally the same way as the guards. The only difference is that they are not guards, and so if you have an ability which impacts only guards, it cannot be used against a boss. The other difference is in how it manages its health. Right now this boss has four health cubes, and so in a single or coordinated attack, the assassins would need to land at least four hits in order to take one cube from the boss. Now that the boss is down to three cubes, it would take three hits to remove the next one, and so on. So this roll of five hits right now would take both the third and second cube away, leaving only one. You may encounter a machine, and you can enter a machine for zero action points, the same way that you'd enter a hiding space. Each machine comes with its own health and abilities, and while you're within the machine, you may only use the machine's abilities, and your health functions in the same way as a boss's health. When you choose to exit a machine, or if the machine is destroyed, treat it as if you're exiting a hiding spot. Some memories will require you to escort an ally as part of your objective. This is a mini which you will need to manage on the map. Allies trigger detection tests in the same way as assassins, and can be incognito or exposed. They can move for free with an assassin, with the exception that they need a ladder to get up on the roof. They can be hidden into a hiding spot, the same way as assassins, but there's only room for one ally or assassin in a spot. Some can join in as part of a coordinated attack as a free action, and others can be harmed or killed in battle. Finally, in later memories, there will be side-by-side -side maps, each with a fast travel station, which you can use to move from one map to the other, becoming incognito if you do. The A and B maps have their own separate states of alert. Assassin's Creed is a campaign with a story which runs from memory to memory, and is tracked in your diary of memories at the end of the campaign book. If you're successful at the memory, you'll turn beyond this instruction to the page which unfolds the next part of the story. Mark your success in the diary, and add any stickers that the rulebook tells you to do. This may include stickers for completing 100% sinks. You'll use the red sticker if you finished it on normal mode, and the grey sticker if you finished it on easy. Now count up all of your experience points, represented by this icon here, and these will come on objectives, chests, bosses, and others. Note this in the memory, and mark it off on the experience track. When you reach or pass a level marker on the experience track, you'll get to level up your assassins, which we'll talk about shortly. In memories 0.1 through 0.3 only, you'll regain any health cubes that you lost in the scenario, but after that, you'll carry on with only the health cubes you have left. The memory instructions may grant you rewards, which you can equip or trade as usual and retain the event, chest, and equipment decks as they were at the end of the memory, as these roll over through the campaign. If you fail a memory the first time you attempt it, then mark the failure in your diary and retry. You'll lose any leftover action cubes you had to start afresh, and any surviving assassins will retry with only the health they have left. Any chests that were gained in this memory are returned in their original order, and players may now freely trade equipment between themselves and the villa, where you keep any equipment you're not using, before retrying. The second time you fail a memory, mark your failure and move on. The Brotherhood of Assassins completes the memory for you, so you'll move on and read the completion text, but you must still return any chests you gained during this memory, and you're not allowed to place any 100% sync stickers, even if you completed that sync. You will still gain experience points, but only for any mandatory objectives you've completed, so any optional objectives or chests will not grant you points. Finally, we'll have a look at what happens between scenarios. After your very first memory, you'll upgrade from the Assassin Apprentice to your named Assassin. When you later reach a level up point, you'll remove this card and then go into your envelope and find the corresponding version of your assassin at the new level. Additionally, find the three small skill cards of your new level from your envelope, and then look at them and choose one to keep, 
placing it into its corresponding slot. The others go back in your envelope. Of course you can reveal the skill, I'm just not showing you for spoiler purposes here. After the first three memories, the assassins may now freely trade equipment items between each other and the villa, which is initially an empty envelope, but this is where you'll store anything you're not using during those memories. After memory 0.4, your villa will be upgraded to your new headquarters. I won't cover the full rules of your headquarters, but I'll give you a quick summary of how it works. You will have some workers, and prior to a memory, you will allocate those workers to the different spaces in your headquarters. They will be working in those areas while you're away on the memory, and then once you come back from the memory with all of your assassins, you will resolve the actions of these minis. Actions include the hospital for healing wounded assassins, the workshop where you can construct blueprints, the shop where you can buy more equipment, and the command room where you'll complete contracts from that headquarters contract deck. The hospital is particularly important. If an assassin is eliminated, then its mini goes to the hospital and cannot be used again until healed. While the assassin is in hospital, which will include at least the next memory, then you will replace your named assassin with your assassin apprentice, and you won't be allowed to use any hidden blades or level 3 or 4 skills that your assassin has collected. You'll get these back when your assassin is healed and ready to compete again. To save your characters between play sessions, simply put your current character card, all of your skills and equipment and any leftover health and action cubes into one of the game's plastic bags. You'll also need to store the current event, chest and equipment decks in their current orders. Finally, if you want to adjust the number of players playing the campaign from scenario to scenario, then there are rules for doing that in section 37 of the rulebook. And that's how to play Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you enjoyed the video, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comments section below. Until next time!